Hey, how are you? Professor Ramon, let's just jump right in on your mark, get set, let's go. Page 455, Amarodarone is where we're going to start up. So Amarodarone, page 455, giving you a little chance to see where we're starting. And then therapeutic class, anti-dysrhythmic pause. Anti-dysrhythmic, dysrhythmias can be too fast or too slow than your regular PQRS complex. This drug is for too fast. So the dysrhythmias are going too fast. This is a drug to slow things down. So anything like bradycardias or blocks, this is not the drug for because this is going to slow you down. You don't slow down a dysrhythmia that's already slow. So therapeutic class, antidysrhythmic for fast, for fast dysrhythmias. Uh, pharmacological class, potassium channel blocker. That's how it achieves its effect of slowing down uh, uh, conduction throughout the heart. The, the automaticity is being decreased. You see that? Amarodarone, structurally similar to thyroid hormone, but it doesn't mean it speeds you up. It just has the same structure. If this drug slows you down, it is approved for the treatment of resistant ventricular tachycardias that may prove to be life-threatening. Pause. Ventricular tachycardia, VTAC. But this is not the drug of choice for VTAC. It says it is approved for the treatment of ventricular. So a proof for resistant. Resistant to what? So usually a VTAC is treated with clear defibrillate. But if it's resistant to the clear and the shock, they might go with this drug. But it's not the drug of choice for it. So what they do is they give it to you as an IV push. Usually in a VTAC, the heart is doing this. You go clear, shock, back to normal. Or it's resistant. Clear shock. Clear shock. Clear shock. Nothing's working. Amarodarone. Back to normal. But sometimes clear shock. Amarodarone. Oh, crap. Now you got a flat line. So that's why the black box warning for this drug kind of towards the bottom says amarodarone has a post-dysrhythmic action and may cause bradycardias, or it may cause a systole sometimes when you're giving it as an IV push. It says amarodarone, uh, what else does it say? Uh, okay. Cardiogenic shock, yeah, or a block might occur. So cardiogenic shock, focus on that word. Cardiogenic shock, it doesn't matter what type of shock, the blood pressure is going to drop. So if you have an overdose of amarodarone or an adverse effect of the amarodarone, you need to speed this person back up. So no surprise that way down at the bottom, the treatment for overdose or reversing. You got to treat the hypotension with what? Normal saline is your first choice. Albumin if ordered and needed, right? But really normal saline. That treats the hypotension or you might give a vasopressor, but now you got to treat the cause of the, of the shock. Remember? Many different types of shock. They all have blood pressure drop in current. Treat the blood pressure and the cause of the shock. In this case, amarodarone down at the bottom. Give atropine or isoprotonol. Isoprotonol is artificial adrenaline to wake you back up because it, this brought you down. Or atropine because that's going to be decrease the relax, anticholinergic. You see that? Good, good, good. However, jump back under actions and uses towards the middle there. IV infusions, usually limited to short-term therapy, normally to two to four days. This is an ICU patient, probably pending cardiac surgery. This drug, however, requires a 10, 10 gram loading dose and then to achieve the steady concentrations. However, look at, they can go up to two to three weeks, or they can go four to eight weeks sometimes with some therapy altogether. You see that? So it does come as a PO, but then it's got a therapeutic range, so now you've got levels that you're checking as well. Don't get too confused with that or for the exam. Uh, what we've mentioned so far is what you should kind of focus on, right? What's the next one? Verapamil, page 456. Verapamil on the very next page. We're still in cardiac dysrhythmias, but remember, this is a what? This is therapeutic class, antidysrhythmic. Oh, it also has an antihypertensive effect. Preload or afterload? Afterload. So this must be a vasodilator in addition to affecting the heart for cardiac dysrhythmias. And it's also an anti-anginal. So angina comes from blood vessels in the coronary blood vessels being constricted. So this one will open up. So this drug, verapamil, is truly a vasodilator and it also affects... Uh, automaticity to some degree. How does it achieve that? Look at the pharmacological class because it affects calcium channels in the in the blood some certain blood vessels throughout the body, but primarily in the heart and in uh, cardiac tissues. Isn't that interesting? So verapamil 
CCB, calcium channel blocker, approved by the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration. So it was the first one and still in use. It says acts by inhibiting flow of calcium ions into myocardial tissue and intravascular smooth muscle. And remember, anytime we're talking intravascular vasodilation constriction, we're not talking veins. We're talking arteries. Arteries, not veins. You see that? What do we also see? Uh, in the blood vessels, arteries, calcium channel blockage lowers blood pressure, reduces cardiac workload dilates coronary blood vessels so that's why they can use them to treat angina as well so angina is just chest pain not necessarily the heart attack stable versus unstable stable angina uh, nitroglycerin take your medic unstable mona mona and let's see what we're dealing with right but right now we're talking calcium channel blockers what else do we need to know contraindications in patients with certain types of blocks certain types of sick sinus rhythm and hypotension obviously if the blood pressure is low then don't give the calcium channel blocker. If the heart rate is too slow, too slow, don't give the calcium channel. So this is also another drug to give to slow the heart down. This is for fast dysrhythmias. Do you see like how you kind of just have to pin what is fast and what is slow and then work it from there and how drugs are either given or not given because of what they do. Either they're going to speed you up or slow you down. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. What's the next drug on the list? Adenosine 456. 456, oh, down at the bottom, adenosine 456, adenosine naturally occurring nucleoside. When given one to two second bolus injection, adenosine terminates serious atrial tachycardias by slowing conduction through the AV node and decreasing automaticity of the SA node. So look at that, and it says it is primarily indicated for a, is, indication is a specific dysrhythmia known as paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias for which it is the preferred drug. That's the part you need to know about adenosine. Let me clarify, because I know that I've said it on this drug that you can give it as an IV push for certain v VTACs or what have you. I think I might have confused myself and maybe confused you, and I've said the same thing about amarodarone. It's amarodarone that I mean with the IV push that causes that effect. However, this can be given also as a bolus, but this is different. This is adenosine. This is more for uh, supraventricular tachycardias, like an atrial problems, which can be just as dangerous as a ventricular one. Now, the reason I have a little bit of discrepancy with both of them, and I bet you if you look into the literature, you might find some even further discrepancy, is because it's been a long time since I take ACLS, and ACLS is a whole protocol of what is the most current step-by-step -step drugs that you give for certain type of dysrhythmias. That thing keeps updating every single time. So when I took it, what, 10, 15 years ago, it's changed four, five, six times. So I'm outdated on what it is. Anybody that took it the last time is outdated on what it is. Textbooks are 10 years outdated from what is out there. And then research is always kind of updating. So um, for the most accurate on an ACLS protocol, see the, AC, the latest ACLS for whatever year that we're in. This is just basic pharmacology, just so you get a grasp of the pathophysiology that the certain drugs are applied to and what the general effects of it are. So just keep it to what we're talking about for what we're being tested for or what, for testing purposes, stick to what we're talking about here. For the most accurate information, it would, uh, which is going to be more for post and NCLEX. NCLEX is going to go by whatever is in the textbooks, the most latest textbooks. Whatever is further down the line beyond what the, when the NCLEX got developed won't be in an NCLEX exam question. You see, unless they have to coincide. However, the next NCLEX exam would include anything from the current, uh, the next version of the NCLEX exam would cover anything that's current in the most current version of the ACLS. So just to clear up some descriptions, I know that's probably going to come up. All right, next drug, uh, is, that was adenosine, uh, procon procainamide, procainamide 450. 450, 450, procanamide, page 450, we're still with antidysrhythmic. So let's see, my guess is that this is going to slow you down as well. Sodium channel blocker, slow down. Because another example of a sodium channel blocker that slows down for sure is lidocaine. So lidocaine, procanamide, they're very similar. They're in the same antidysrhythmic class, and they're both sodium channel blockers. So this drug is going to slow you down. So again, this is a drug for fast dysrhythmias. And if you're too slow, then don't give it. So not for blocks, not for bradycardias. You see that? Keep it simple. It's either fast or slow, so that's what you need to identify whenever you see the name of any rhythm. I'm not going to give you strips for you to identify, right? 
So procainamide, older drug approved since 1950, yada, yada, a little bit further down. Uh, procainamide, oops, it says uh, procainamide, or is it block sodium ion channels in myocardial cells, thus reducing automaticity, slowing down conduction, and action potentials in myocardium. You see that? Procainamide is, is referred to as broad spectrum drug because it has the ability to correct many different types of, boom, atrial and ventricular dysrhythmias, but it doesn't say fast or slow, but I'm telling you it's pretty fast. A little bit further down, um, it says therapeutic serum levels. It's got four to eight micrograms. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to hit you there, but look at your black box warning right smack in the middle. Procainamide should be uh, reserved for life-threatening dysrhythmias. So it is a, a broad spectrum, per se, for dysrhythmias, different types. But look at that. It should be, why, why save it reserved for the life-threatening? Because it has the ability to produce a bunch of worse ones, which means slows you down. And on top of that, agranulocytosis, bone marrow suppression, neutropenia, reported in the first three months of therapy. So this is for people that are taking this peel on the regular because it does come in, does it come in a peel form? Yeah, I'm not sure. Look at that. that. That's interesting. First three months. That seems odd to me that it would be for three months. It would keep therapy on that for that long. But consider those three. That's where the, the concern is with this drug, with the black box warning. So monitor for temperatures. If you have an older patient, watch out for LOCs. If you're urine samples as well, just see if there's infections going on. Uh, good. Procainamide. Asystole. Page 439. Let me see what I have there. 439. 439. So, asystole. What the heck is asystole? Asystole is, you know how you have systolic and diastolic? Okay? Systole, systole, diastole. Systole, diastole. Diastole. If you say asystole, it means nothing. There's neither of the two is going on. Because systole means relaxed. No, systole means contracted. Diastole means relaxed. It means in preparation for another contraction. So systole, diastole. Systole, diastole. Asystole means neither of the two. You've gone flatline. Does that make sense? You need to know what that term means, asystole. So the reason I'm mentioning that is that because I keep seeing people saying that we... Uh, uh, what do we say? We shock for a flat line. You do not. You do not. You're already stopped. So what are you stopping? There's nothing to stop. In this case, we need to wake you up. We need to give you right here on page 439, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine and on the following page, epinephrine. You are the two. What do I have on this page? Epinephrine, norepinephrine, page 439, 440. They need to wake you up. Of course, there's other drugs. And again, ACLS, there's probably something that they're using in combination with it. But for the most part, these are the drugs that are adrenaline, artificial adrenaline, to get you back up. This is your isoproteinol as well. So that's the reason I'm mentioning it, that these are the drugs of choice for, epine for uh, asystole. Uh, so we're talking enotropics, basically. So remember, you have preload drugs, afterload drugs, and within the heart, enotropics. This would be more on the enotropic level. It's causing the heart to contract, and it's increasing the heart rate. So look at what we have here, Don. Uh, what do we have for norepinephrine, page 439? Uh, therapeutic class, drug for shock. What happens in shock? The blood pressure drops. So you give this drug, it's liquid stress, vasoconstrict. So if you got in a flat line, there's nothing. What do you do? You give stress, vasoconstrict, doom, 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 get that heart wake, waking back up. The epinephrine, and on the next page, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So let's read a little bit more. Norepinephrine, 439, pharmacological class, non-selective adrenergic agonist. Non-selective means not just in the heart, not just in the lungs. It's non-selective, head to toe, boom, stress, everything, sympathetic. It's non-selective because some drugs are selective just for the heart, just in the lungs. You see that? Not this puppy. This is head to toe. Head to toe adrenergic agonist, vasopressor, Ooh, drugs for shock. Bring the blood pressure up and then treat the cause of the shock. Normal saline, albumin if you need it. You see that? You have to think dynamically like that. Norepinephrine, sympathomimetic. You got to know those words. Sympathomimetic, it imitates as opposed to a sympatholytic, like a beta blocker. You see that? Same with our cholinergic, parasympathomimetic, and anticholinergic, parasympatholytic. You need to know those terms. Up, down, up, down. Increase the stress, decrease the stress. Increase the relax, decrease the relax. Relax. This is sympathomimetic. 
increase the stress, boom, acts directly on alpha adrenergic receptors, vascular smooth muscle, immediate raise in, but immediate, immediate, look at that. To a lesser degree, it also stimulates beta receptors a little bit, producing a positive, bam, inotropic response. So this is they, this chapter puts it as an inotropic, and that's why. It's technically a sympathomimetic, but that secondary inotropic effect affects the heart and increases the stretchiness. Increases the stretchiness, you see that? So we keep moving on. It says, uh, thus producing a positive inotropic a response that may increase the cardiac output. Primary indicators are, indications are, in other words, why would you use this drug? Acute shock. Man, those are two tough words. Acute and shock. Now, acute shock, that's bad. Cardiac arrest, norepinephrine, vasopressor of choice, and septic shock. Because research has determined that it is significantly decreases the mortality. Look at that. Isn't that fantastic? Given by IV route, uh, has a duration one to two minutes. Yeah, after the termination of the infusion. Yeah, so it's wake your ass up. So that's why don't be surprised if in the middle of the code, give an epi, dude, one epi down, give a second epi, give a second epi. Yeah, they might give several of them in a row because it gets cleared very quick. But consider the damage on the kidneys, that constriction, right? Uh, norepinephrine, powerful vasoconstrictor, thus continuous monitoring of blood pressure. So what do you think is gonna, it's going to look like if you gave them too much? A spike in the blood pressure, an increase in the heart rate that sustains higher up. You see that? Black box warning extravasation so you must have a patent IV because if you have it in the IV and it spills from the veins out into the tissue it's gonna extravasate it's gonna make the skin rot and fall off like the walking dead like zombie like and not immediate but it has a permanent tissue damage effect so what do you do for that right there it says infiltrate immediately five to ten milligrams phentolamine so phentolamine means you're gonna it's a drug you're gonna get in a syringe, because here was the IV. Let me see if I can see my arm. Here was the IV on this vein right here. It infiltrated the epinephrine because you were giving it IV epinephrine. So now you got to drop some phentolamine in a syringe and you got to in inject, inject, inject all around the infiltration site. It's trying to keep it in one area and to neutralize the drug right there. You see that? In fact, norepinephrine or epinephrine can also be used to infiltrate other the same skin for other types of extravasation. Keep that in mind. So if it extravasates, which is kind of contradictory, right? Actually, it's the epinephrine that they'll use, the one on the next page, page 440. That's the one that they'll use to infiltrate the skin. The norepinephrine is just IV, not into the skin, yeah. So anyway, so that's your drug right there. Look at the treatment for overdose, discontinue it, yeah, which results in rapid reversal of effect. So is there a drug or reversal agent for norepinephrine? Not really. You just stop stop the infusion, probably increase the normal saline, slap on a Foley, keep an eye on the urinoctyl. Look on the next page. Also, another drug for asystole. So no shocks for asystole. You need stressors. So look on page 440, epinephrine. Drug for anaphylaxis, anaphylactic shock. This is what we give. So bee stings, penicillin reactions, uh, sulfonamide reaction, any kind of drug reactions, look at that, anaphylactic shock, airway closing up, this is what we want to give. Uh, look at how we were giving the norepinephrine for shock and it's IV, so you got to make sure you have a patent IV. Epinephrine is different, epinephrine you inject can direct into the muscle. That's why they have the bee stings, you know, for if you have an allergic reaction to bee sting and you keep it in the fridge and you teach the kids to give themselves an IM, that's epinephrine. So look at that. Norepinephrine, IV, don't let it extravasate. But epinephrine can be given IM. Look at down at the bottom. Subcutaneous or IM as opposed to the another one, norepinephrine, IV. Interesting. Look at that. So epinephrine, on the other hand, same thing. Uh, Non-selective, adrenergic, vasopressor. Subcutaneous IV preferred drug for anaphylaxis because it can reverse many of the distressing symptoms within minutes. Epinephrine non-selective agonist affects both smooth and beta. Almost immediate after injection, blood pressure rises due to stimulation of alpha and beta receptors of uh, bronchi, bronchodilates, yep, and it opens up the bronchioles. This has more of a bronchial effect, so I'm not surprised that for uh, anaphylactic shock, that's why it's the drug of choice so that it can open up the airways as well. Subcutaneous routes or IM.
a little bit over on the other side, contraindications in life-threatening conditions such as the anaphylaxis, no absolute contraindications for the use of epinephrine. The drug must be used with caution, however, in patients with dysrhythmias because it could, it could, this is going to stress you out. So this is more given for a slow dysrhythmia. So finally, all the other drugs we've been talking about dysrhythmia so far will slow you down, not this, these. These two speed you up. So these two drugs can be for asystole. These two drugs might be for bait, um, uh, blockages. This might be for bradycardia. So these are for the slow dysrhythmias. Does that make sense? Both of these drugs. Overdose may be serious. Uh, and it says alpha and beta adrenergic blockers are indicated. So what can you give for an epinephrine overdose? Beta blockers, alpha blockers, LOLs, and SINs. Look at that. So interesting, both of those drugs right there. So and don't forget that they're considered, the other one is, the norepinephrine is considered inotropic because of that secondary effect that it has. Look at the table on page 444. Let's go to 444. 444. So we keep saying fast dysrhythmias, slow dysrhythmias, blocks, VTAX, atrial fib. So this is the good one because look at right there, table 30.1, types of dysrhythmias. If you hear atrial or ventricular tachycardia, that's fast. So you're not going to give epinephrine and norepinephrine. You see that? You're going to give more of the other drugs, the amarodarone, the verapamil, the adenosine, the procainamide, those kinds of the lidocaine. Look at the next one, atrial or ventricular flutter. Flutter means... It's just stuff up too fast. You're dancing way too fast to this song. You see that? So you got to slow that dance down to go back to the rhythm. The PQRS, PQRS, PQR. We need you there. Look at the next ones. Atrial and ventricular fibs. Uh, this is worse. Actually, sometimes the flutters might be worse. It depends. No, actually, fib. It goes from a flutter, and then it goes into a fib, and then you get into bad territory. So they evolve. You start out with just a normal... And then it's possible you start to throw a PVC extra. Look at down at the bottom. Premature, premature atrial or premature ventricular contraction. That's considered a fast. It's a trip. Because once you have one ahead of time, because it's supposed to be beat, 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 beat. And then you have a PVC, a preventricular, beat, 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 beat. That's a PVC. You got them two in a row, beat, 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 beat. beat. Beep, 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 beep. That's a, that's a couplet. Triplets is bad. Beep, 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 beep. What's coming back? Beep, 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 beep. And now you're back to a, you're in a VTAC. So these could evolve. That's why it takes a lot of proficiency at knowing what the monitor is doing to see what's happening in the heart to know what medication you give. So in this case, look, atrial ventricular tachycardia is fast. Atrial ventricular flutter, fast. Atrial ventricular fib, fast. Heart block, slow. Heart block type 1, type 2, type 3. Block. Slow. So here you're going to give epinephrine, norepinephrine. Wake them up. PVCs. It's considered fast. It's an extra step ahead of time. It's fast. The slowest of the fast, but fast nonetheless. Look at the next one. Sinus bradycardia. Slow. And it's on its way to the slowest of the slow, asystole. So don't shock. Don't shock for asystole. Right? Good, good, good. All righty. So, and don't forget down on the left-hand side, 444, left-hand side, italicized, supraventricular tachycardia. So look at that sentence. It says, dysrhythmias that orig originate in the atria are sometimes referred to as supraventricular tachycardia. So SVT is an atrial dysrhythmia, not a ventricular dysrhythmia. Does that make sense? Good, good, good. All right, what's the next thing we've got? Uh, Bronx. Beta blockers, page 447, 447, 447, I have a little conversation there first on beta blocker. So beta blocker class 2, beta blocker LOL, beta blocker slow down. So this is going to be for fast dysrhythmias. So obviously if the heart rate is too low, not a, not a beta blocker. Does that make sense? When can you give a beta blocker if the heart is going too fast or if you've got an overdose of one of the other drugs that makes you go too fast, you could slow them down, like the epinephrine, right? So uh, let's see. So that's one example right there that's showing you at what point the beta blockers kick in on the class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4. It is class 2 drugs. Then if we look over on page 448, 448 down at the bottom, 
Table 30.2, classification of the antidysrhythmics, class 1, 2, 3, 4, beta blocker, class 2. The example it gives is propanolol. You scroll to the right, what is it? That? It slows conduction velocity. So a beta blocker is different. It's not going to slow down conduction velocity on the automaticity. It has no, not an effect on the SA node, AV node, PK thunderbolt. That has its own little rhythm that keeps itself going. Remember how I told you automaticity was like that stadium and everybody's doing the wave and everybody's doing, and why are they doing the wave? Because the rhythm keeps going, the rhythm keeps going, the rhythm keeps going. That's SA node, AV node, PK bundles, bundles of his, that's that. Beta blocker doesn't affect that. That has to keep going. Otherwise, if you fall asleep, and that stops where you're going to die every time you, you, you die if you go to sleep. But you go to sleep and the brain is not telling the heart to keep going. It goes on its own. That's the automaticity. That's going to keep going no matter what until you die, right? A beta blocker affects the sympathetic stimulation that comes in. So the brain stresses out and sends a signal to the automaticity. Go faster. Go faster. See, that's a sympathetic reaction. But if there's no sympathetic stimulation, it, then this is the regular rhythm of automaticity whatever rhythm it is when you're asleep. But the minute you wake up, any kind of stimulation, you get it? That's a sympathetic stimulation. That's where a beta blocker comes in. What do you think it blocks? It blocks sympathetic stimulation. You get it? That's why a, it's a sympatholytic. You get it? Yeah, yeah. So that's, where, that's why it says right there, slows conduction velocity, decreases the automaticity by, but how? by blocking sympathetic stimulation. But the automaticity nonetheless keeps going. You see that? So if we look over on the next page, page 449, let's find it. Do, 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 do. Propanolol, uh, uh, right there. Class two beta blocker, scroll to the right, PO and IV. And then scroll to the right, look at some of the adverse effects. Fatigue, I have heard of people that start taking beta blockers for the first time and they say they get real low energy and real sleepy because of all that stress they were under before, and then you block that sympathetic stimulation, and you it's kind of like your body's like slowing, like, oh, thank goodness, you know, it's kind of recovering. So there is some complaints of fatigue. However, look at the opposite, insomnia as well. Drowsiness, complete opposite. Impotence, yes, I have heard of problems with impotence with these drugs, with the beta blockers. But look at the biggest, bigger concerns that are underlying. Agranulocytosis is your big one there. Let's go see your prototype drug for this on the next, where is it? Propanolol, 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 page 453. So propanolol, and it says therapeutic class, antidysrhythmic. Look to the right, beta adrenergic agonist. Propanolol, non-selective beta adrenergic blocker. See that? Affects the heart and the lungs, receptors in pulmonary and vascular smooth muscle. Propanolol reduces heart rate, slows myocardial conduction, velocity, and lowers blood pressure a little bit. Propanolol is most effective treating tachycardias that is caused by excessive sympathetic stimulation. It is approved for a wide variety of diseases, including hypertension, angina, migraine, and the prevention of NMI as well. A little bit further down, it can be given for post-traumatic stress. Look at also for thyroid storms. So sometimes thyroid storm, too much uh, thyroid stimulation, and you're speeding up. So they might give some uh, uh, this drug to kind of neutralize some of that effect there as well. Look at your administration alert. Abrupt discontinuation may cause an MI, may cause severe uh, hypertension, and may even cause a ventricular di uh, dysrhythmias. Uh, what else do we see there? If pulse is less than 60 beats per minute, notify the healthcare provider and definitely wait before you give it. So if the heart is too slow, there's other con contraindications to this drug, and particularly heart failure and asthma. Because in heart failure, and the heart failure can be because the heart is not pumping, enotropic problem. Heart failure can be because there's too much blood volume, preload problem. Or heart failure can be because there's a vasoconstriction occurring, afterload problem. You see that? In this case, though, heart failure, either way, the heart is going to be working way too hard regardless of where the problem is. So you're trying to increase. You know, giving a beta blocker is going to slow the heart down even more. You're going to drown them in their own fluid. So that's why we don't give uh, beta blockers for heart failure. And the other one is going to be uh, for uh, asthma, COPD as well, because of the that's a bronchospasm problem. And if you give a beta blocker, you stop them from trying to even bronchodilate or constrict. 
so you make the asthma worth you, you actually uh, you stop them from breathing so look at how either way there's a pulmonary compromise you see that so be careful because yeah heart failure and um, asthma no beta blockers watch out now there is a couple of them that are out there that they might give to some of them don't split hairs at this point you're not at that level of proficiency right now you're at the beginner level so you just have to always have a concern with anything that ends in lol and the patient has heart failure and the pay or the patient has a uh, uh, asthma question the order or, or double check on the order just because of the level of where you're at just now right and then later on you'll build up your proficiency a little bit further on the other but on the top right hand side also says watch out with patients with uh, diabetes because it could drop the blood sugars as well Black box warning, abrupt with withdrawal is not advised when patients have got angina or heart disease. Dosage should be gradually reduced one to two weeks to give the drug, uh, and the drug should be reinstituted if angina symptoms begin to develop. A little bit further down, contraindications, anything that's slow. If you've got a heart block, definitely you're not going to give this because it's going to slow you down even more. So this is a drug more for fast dysrhythmias. Does that make sense? Look at it that way, fast, slow, fast, slow. Uh, what else do we have? And I said, bro, blockers, page 447, 440, propanol, 5, 453, and then what else we got? 413, page 413. I have them all the page numbers because I wanted to cut to the chase so I don't make it such a long video. So 413, what's the next term here? STEMI versus non-STEMI. So yes, I hope we understand the PQRS complex, ST, elevated, that's a STEMI, because the ST is elevated when you're looking on the echocardiogram. Great, but you need to know what's going on on the inside of the heart when the ST is elevated, and what's going on inside the heart when the ST is not elevated. So one thing is what the monitor says, but you need to make the connection of what's going on in the patient's heart. So which is more dangerous, STEMI versus non-STEMI? STEMI is more dangerous. Why? Because of the nature of the heart attack and the type of drugs we're going to have to give to try to treat that problem. You see that? So the STEMI, ST is elevated because there's an actual thrombus, a clot, like a scab. Literally, like a, you cut yourself and it's a, a scab. There's a, a freaking scab stuck inside one of the blood vessels in the coronary blood vessels. So that block is there, causes that ST to elevate. So this patient immediately is going to need a thrombolytic, anything that ends in ACE, because that, once you give it IV, is going to break apart all clots, factors, because there's two ways you control bleeding, platelets and factors. I'm not talking about platelets. I'm talking about factors, which come from your liver, factor one, factor two, factor three, all the way to 14, 13, 14. So that's what I'm talking about. That's what a you got to turn all of those off and break everything else apart. So you need to give a, a plasminogenase, um, retoplase, actoplase, a TNKase. That's what you need to give. For a STEMI, it's a clot. The non-STEMI, it's not elevated, but you're getting the signs and symptoms. And then you get, either way, you're going to get cardiac enzymes. Either way. Either way, you're going to put them on an EKG. Either way, you might even give a GI cocktail, either way, depending on what the hospital or ER protocol is, right? GI cocktail is to rule out heartburn from heart attack. More on that later. So we draw cardiac enzymes. We put them on an EKG. This guy's got an ST that's elevated. He needs a thrombolytic. Let's put give that to him IV. Put him on complete bed rest because if he falls out of bed and he hits his head, he could bleed to death. So that's, that's the STEMI out of the way. The non-STEMI now, well, something else is causing this. So we're going to give Mona to begin with, morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin. You should know what each one of those does. So the morphine decreases the O2 demand. The oxygen increases the oxygen saturation. You can give O2 2 liters nasal cannula, slap a pulse oximeter because if you overgive it with the, if you overgave morphine, you're going to decrease the saturation and now you get, got to give Narcan. So morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a vasodilator. It's going to open up coronary blood vessels. I believe it has a little bit of an inotropic effect as well. However, it opens up coronary blood vessels to increase the blood flow because we're not sure what's going on here, but it's definitely not a STEMI. It's most probably arteriosclerosis. So now you have morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin. The aspirin is there to thin out platelets because aspirin is an antiplatelet drug. So if he's got a clot in here somewhere, it's definitely not a, 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 a clot that's made out of a scab. 
because we already ruled out that it's not a STEMI. Because I said you can clot in two ways, factors or platelets. Those throm the thrombolytics, ACEs, that's for the factors. We're done with that. Platelet, it could be a plate. So the non-STEMI is going to maybe have a little something, something to affect the platelets. What is that? Aspirin. What does aspirin do? It increases the, it decreases the viscosity of the blood. Because if you've got a clot somewhere in the heart there, it's definitely not a scab. It's probably a cholesterol clot, a cholesterol plaque, or a blood vessel that no longer vasodilates and constrict because it's so packed up with cholesterol that it lost that ability. You get it? So the only way you're going to know this is now you're probably going to have to go down to the cardiac cath, put in the dye, take a picture, see what it's got. And then you get a patient history because now you're getting into lifestyle, diet. Look at his physical appearance. He might have the apple shape. You see, get it? So that's the STEMI versus the non-STEMI. So the non-STEMI is probably going to require a cardiac surgery, a cabbage coronary artery bypass graft, non-STEMI. So they're both critical, but the STEMI is going to require immediate attention because the only way to get to the cause is to give these hardcore drugs that now you're going to turn off clotting factors and now you got to keep them on bed rest. And on the other side, you're giving something for the platelets just in case it's to increase vis decrease viscosity. Morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin on, on board. Let's get some more diagnostics. Either way, you're going to get cardiac enzymes. I hope that clarifies the difference between the STEMI and the non-STEMI. Look on page 413. Because right there it starts talking about down at the bottom on the left hand side, arteriosclerosis, the presence of plaque. And you read that on your own and look at the picture up at the top on 413 on the top right hand side. That's the plaque we're talking about. So do you see why we're giving now a little bit of aspirin, a little bit of morphine, a little bit of nitroglycerin and then all that plaque, what are you going to do? You can't go in and scrape it out. You got to take the whole blood vessel out and you got to put in a brand new pipe in there. That's the cabbage. That's the non stemming you see, and probably a history. This didn't happen overnight. This happened over a, about a decade or two. A decade might could do it. You see that? So over on the next page, do I say 4414? Uh, let me see where I'm at. Let me say 413. 422 I have. I'm trying to stick to just my review so I can make it a shorter video. 422, I put some, there it is, on the right-hand side. Look at how you're talking about two primary types of acute coronary syndromes are unstable angina and an MI. So not stable versus unstable. It's unstable or a full-blown MI. Unstable means you're getting the chest pain, but you're not entirely, it's not a STEMI. This is where Mona comes in to buy us some time to see, well, what the heck is going on? Because the full-blown MI is clogged up. But again, it could be a full-blown MI, but it could be a STEMI or a non-STEMI full-blown MI. You see that? Look at how we move a little bit further down. Both caused by the same technical pathophysiology, which is ischemia, but ischemia for two different reasons. A little bit further down, unstable angina gives the same extreme chest pain as an MI. So unstable, just uh, angina, chest pain. The thrombus causing the pain, however, has not completely occluded, occluded a coronary artery. So initial management is moan. A little bit further down, an MI occurs when the coronary becomes completely occluded. Deprived of oxygen, the affected area of the myocardium, uh, myocardium is ischemic. So already we're having myocyte, which is uh, uh, cardiac cells, begin to die within 20 minutes. So this is why time is of the essence and why CPR is so important, so you can compress and get perfusion going. A little bit further down, an EKG can give important clues about the ex extent and the location of an MI. Infraction, infracted regions of the myocardium is non-conducting and usually produces abnormalities of the Q, T, ST segments. When the ST is elevated, a STEMI, uh, that's a STEMI, that's a thrombolytic. MI must be treated aggressively because mortality rate is very high. A little bit further down, the very first bullet point, restore blood supply reperfusion to damage myocardium as quickly as possible through the use of thrombolytics things in an ACE that's the STEMI so it doesn't quite clarify the difference be between the two but I'm, I'm clarifying it for you right here very good so I hope we clarified there uh, 426 I also have something page 426 426 there you go that's what you would be giving yeah for the STEMI
Right a place. That's why it's in this chapter. Therapeutic class dissolves clots. How about you write on there STEMI instead? Take your pen and write therapeutic class, drugs for STEMIs. ST elevated myocardial infarction. What is it? It's a thrombolytic. Your concern is how you give it and then the safety precautions because once you give it, you've turned off all clotting mechanisms. So prepared through DNA, yeah, yeah, yeah. Administered, look how it says, like other drugs in this class, Redipay should be given as soon as possible after the onset of MI symptoms. Uh, administered by IV bolus, it, it usually acts within 20 minutes. Second bolus is injected 30 minutes uh, after the first. It comes in a tackle box with a timer and two syringes. So you open up the tackle box and then you set the timer because you give it over a certain amount of time. I think it's two, three minutes. Then you set the timer. And when the timer rings, you do the second dose. Yeah. And then you keep them in complete bed rest while you do it. I've, I've given this like maybe about, about 10, maybe about a dozen times I've done this. Reconstitute the drug immediately prior to use. Oh, I must have given one that was pre-prepared. It must not have been read a place that I gave. This was years ago. This is like over 15 years ago. Uh, dilute first and then administer. Do not give any other drugs simultaneously. Redoplace and heparin, incompatible. You're going to double decrease. You imagine, consider what the PTT INR would be once you give these drugs. Too fast or too slow? Too high or too low? And what do you do? Adverse effects, bleeding. Prolonged bleeding. Yeah, so complete bed rest. Because look at what is the treatment for overdose. No treatment. So if they fall out of bed and literally start the hemorrhage, now you're auto transfusing blood and treating the blood, the bleed, and find where the cause of the bleed is. Now you've got a major surgery, and then you can. You can't even operate on them because if you cut them open, they start to bleed even there. So that's why that damn call bill. That's why I keep them in bed. That's why side rails up, bed down, complete bed rest, get your documentation. What else do they need? Keep them comfortable because they have to stay in bed. If they fall out of bed and hurt themselves and bleed internally, you can't even get to the source of the bleed because you're already going to you see it. So now you're, and look at, and like I said, there's no specific treatment for the overdose. So safety, safety, safety. You see how we went from a STEMI to a call bell? That's what NCLEX, this is how you test safety and competence. You don't have to be an expert. It's not medical school, but you need to demonstrate that you're safe and that you're competent in dealing with these these drugs and the only way to measure that is by throwing test questions at you that this is why this is why we're doing this material twice because this is how I want to make sure if you're graduating from my pharmacology class you're leaving knowing this stuff <laughs> uh, so that's your 426 right there so we know about that drug there what else we got diuretics page 401 we're going on an hour I might make this I'm gonna try to keep it under an hour if, if it goes over an hour I'll do two videos I apologize for that I'm trying to keep it specific but this is the important stuff diuretics on page 401 Oh, man, we could go all day here. For, look at diuretics. Look at how it already divides them up for you. Loop diuretics at the top. Eumetadine, furosemide, terosemide. And look at how Lasix is your prototype drug. It's on page 348. We don't even have to go to it. I'm going to tell you right now. Loop diuretics, the effect of loop of Henley, they make you dump everything. You're going to dump water, sodium, potassium, magnesium, chloride. You name it, you're going to dump it. So it's a good idea to get an electrolyte panel prior to giving it so that you know whether or not this is the right type of diuretic to give. Nevertheless, why are you giving diuretics? You need to decrease fluid in the body. So this is to decrease preload, provided the potassium is within normal le levels. Because if, if, if it's, you're going to have a problem, in this case, it's probably going to be with the potassium. You see that? Because if the potassium is already too low, then the loop diuretic you're not going to give. But he's drowning in his own fluid. He has CHF. Then give a potassium sparing diuretic, which is further down at the bottom of that list. Potassium sparing diuretic, aldosterone. Spironolactone is your drug of choice. There's spironolactone, page 5, 351. So we'll look at that right now, sorry, and we'll go through them. So keep in mind, this is if the potassium is too low. If the potassium is normal or high, give the loop diuretic. Because the concern is getting fluids down because this is a preload problem. That's why the patient is in CHF. Because it could be due to preload, it could be due to afterload, it could be due to uh, 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 inotropic agents, contractility. There you go, that's the word I was looking for. So this is another diuretic, spironolactone. That's your concern, potassium levels. So you should know your normal potassium levels, 3.5 to 5.5. See that? 
So you have loop diuretics at the top, potassium sparing diuretics at the bottom, and then right smack in the middle, thiazide diuretic, hydrochlorothiazide, page 350. Most popular of the three. Minimum influence on the electrolyte, but get some fluid out. This is, of all of these diuretics, which one of these is going to be one of the first line drugs versus second line drugs of hypertension? The hydrochlorothiazide. So common that it's in combination with all the other drugs so that they put it all in one field with well, what other drugs? All the other drugs that are in first class. And we'll take a first line drugs for hypertension. Does that make sense? So really quick, uh, loop diuretics. Let's just take a quick look at that. Page four, 348. Keep your finger on 401. But let's 348, 348 real quick just to see if we're missing anything on Lasix. But I think we nailed the main concepts there to be quite honest. 348, loop diuretic, furosemide, given for heart failure. When given IV, diuresis begins in five minutes. So slap on a Foley in this case. You might need a Foley. If you're trying to give it to a patient because of an emergency, and the only way you're going to know that this medication is working is if you measure the urine output. So don't be surprised that if in the middle of a code or in the middle of a problem of a hypertensive crisis, they're going to say slap on a Foley because the medications you're going to give, that's the only way that you're going to be able to measure the effectiveness of a diuretic. And that goes for all diuretics. Uh, another thing it goes for all diuretics is a safety. Con and this is for maintenance. Everyday diuretics, first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning, because you're going to be going to the restroom all day, urinating all day, and if you give them too late in the, in the day, you're going to have this patient getting up in the middle of the night, nocturia, and you're increasing the chances of a fall. So safety, you're back to safety again. That's for all diuretics, right? Uh, in this case, loop diuretics, watch the potassium. Black box warning, potent diuretic. Given in excessive amounts may lead to profound diuresis, profound electrolyte depletion. Consider potassium. Consider uh, the electrolyte levels before and after as well, you know. Uh, not only that, if given IV, 1 cc per minute, 1 ml per minute. Usual dose, 80 milligrams, 10 milligrams. That's 10 minutes. 8, yeah. 8, eight milligrams. 10 milligrams. What is it, Ben? Given dose peak, it doesn't go with dosages, does it, Ben? It doesn't. It doesn't give any dosages. It just goes onset, peak, and duration. 1 cc is usually 1 milligram, and that's over 1 minute, is usually what I remember. So, how do you know it works? They're urinating. Back to page 401, uh, spironolactone, page 351. Let's look at that. Page 351, spironolactone, antihypertensive, reduces edema, potassium sparing diuretic, aldosterone antagonist. So, this might be something antagonist. It, it'll, it'll help. It decreases aldosterone as well. So not, not, so it stops the, so, the aldosterone, which lets you get rid of sodium, which releases the water as well. Plus, it's a potassium-sparing diuretic as well. So that's how it affects blood pressure. So uh, your main thing with spironolactone is watch, watch the potassium levels. Because look at your black box warning also. Spironolactone has also been found to cause tumors in some clinical trials in animals. should only be uh, used... For specified indications. And what is the specified indication? Hypokalemia, right? But CHF with hypokalemia. You're already too low, so then don't give Lasix, give spironolactone. Back on page 401, what do you have? Hydrochlorothiazide, page 350 as well on the next page. 350, hydrochlorothiazide right there. Drugs for hypertension and for edema, thiazide diuretic. Actions, uh, most widely prescribed diuretic for hypertension because it's given in combination with other drugs. And it says, like many diuretics, produces few serious effects. It says uh, its effects are producing a 10 to 20 milligram uh, per uh, mercury drop in reduction of, of blood pressure. Uh, patients with severe hypertension or uh, compelling conditions may require the addition of a second drug. So this is going to be one of your first-line drugs for hypertension. Uh, we'll look to see. That's on the hypertension page. I believe it comes up in a little bit. So we'll look to see because you need to know what are your first-line drugs for hypertension and the second-line drugs. This is most definitely a first-line drug in combination with others. Look on page. I think I, I put out. 
first line drugs and second line drugs for high blood pressure. I think I I put the page number somewhere. It'll come up. I know I have it on the review here, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait till we get to that. Next part, ACEs and ARBs, page 401. 401, ACEs and ARBs, let's start there, same page. ACEs and ARBs right at the top. Distinct difference between the two. ACEs and ARBs, ACEs and then PRIL, ARBs and then 10. ACEs and ARBs, what do they have in common? Both of them are going to decrease aldosterone which means both of them will decrease sodium, right? Which, mean, which means you're going to let go of sodium, which means both of them decrease water, which means both of them decrease blood volume. So both of these drugs are for preload. They do nothing for vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Does that make sense? So ACEs and ARBs affect aldosterone. So in turn, this is for preload, along with the diuretics, preload. All of this was preload so far. So look at how you have at the top page 401, your ACE in particular, and lisinopril. Another thing, they have a difference, though. They affect al aldosterone, but in two very different ways. So remember the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which eventually releases aldosterone. The conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 occurs in the lungs. ACE inhibitors, right, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, that conversion that they block is inside the lungs. So no surprise that an ACE inhibitor, one of the side effects or adverse effects, if it's not tolerable, and, uh, tolerable is a dry cough, a non-productive dry cough. So where do we have this in the pro? It says uh, it's a prototype drug. I believe it's on the previous page, page 400. Lisinopril, drugs for heart failure and for hypertension, ACE inhibitor. It prevents aldosterone, decreases the sodium, decreases the water, decreases the blood pressure. Preload. A little bit further down, as other as with other ACE inhibitors, two to three weeks of therapy might be required to meet maximum effectiveness. Several months of therapy might be needed for cardiac function to return to normal. A little bit further down, it talks about fixed doses, and a little bit further down, in combination with hydrochlorothiazide. So ACE inhibitors is also a first-line drug for hypertension. They're going to try these combination of drugs first, and if that doesn't work, or if it's contraindicated because of your comorbidities, then they'll go with the second line. But this is part of the first line therapies. Down at the bottom, adverse effects, hyperkalemia may occur on with this kind of drug therapy. Too much. So hyperkalemia may occur with this therapy. Electrolyte levels should be monitored. Black box warning, fetal injury, death may occur with uh, ACE inhibitors if taken during pregnancy. Look at that. So Females of childbearing age, this is a consideration to, to keep in mind. Look at the overdose. It's low blood pressure, so you treat the low blood pressure and then treat the cause. It's not a shock, but the same thing in this case, probably normal saline, and flush it out and then make sure that they urinate the drug out of it. So get the pharmacokinetics in and out of the body. Get it in and get it out, right? Uh, what else do we have on that list? ACEs and ARBs 401 you have. ARBs, just make sure that you know the name of it and that how it, how it takes effect for aldosterone. So where the ACE blocks the conversion in the lungs, the ARB blocks at the receptor level on the adrenal glands so that the angiotensin 2 does not affect the release of aldosterone. That's the only difference between the ACE and the ARB. So what else is on your list? Digoxin page 403. 403 right here, digoxin. So look at how they have it as therapeutic class for heart failure. Cardiac glycoside. So glycoside means it is going to affect, have an inotropic effect and will affect contractility. So glycoside, inotropic effect, contractility, all of that is stretchiness. You want to slow the heart rate down, but you want to increase the stretchiness. You see that? Instead of just doing half little, little contractions that are not good cardiac output, you slow the contraction down with increasing the stretchiness. That increases the cardiac output with a decrease in the heart rate. You see that? Yeah. And don't forget your formula. Stroke volume times heart rate, heart rate equals cardiac output, right? Good, good, good. So digoxin, lenoxin, you should know about dig toxicity and then potassium levels. Because look at how we have down at the bottom adverse effects. Digoxin has the ability to create certain dysrhythmias up at the top in patients who have hypokalemia or impaired renal function. 
So you want to get uh, potassium levels when you've got digoxin. Also, look if you keep reading a little bit, other adverse effects in therapy, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, visual disturbances, and seeing halos, green and yellow, blurry, digitoxicity. You're getting toxic. That's the main sign. You need to get that overdose treated down at the bottom, digibind. So IV digibind, also known as immunofab. Immunofab will bind with the digoxin that's in your system and pull it out. Get the pharmacokinetics going. You see that? Good, good. So that's what we give digoxin. So it'll increase the contractility by slowing down the heart rate. Good. Are we doing on time? Five more minutes for the top of the hour. Let's see what else we have. Heart failure, page 398. I think we talked about this already. Well, I'll throw in a little 398. 397, page 398. Left-hand side up at the top. Although uh, left-sided heart failure is more common, right? Look at a little bit. Though. Though the, through the appropriate pharmacotherapy and lifestyle modifications, many patients with heart failure, what my lifestyle modifications, cut the salt, get some exercise. You see that? And then uh, pharmacotherapy, lifestyle modifications, uh, many patients with heart failure can be maintained in an asymptomatic state for years. When the heart reaches a stage at which it can no longer handle the workload capacity, cardiac decompensation can occur. Classic symptoms of heart failure might develop dyspnea upon exertion, fatigue, pulmonary congestion, peripheral edema. This is what the patient looks like. You should know what a CHF patient looks like. So think signs and symptoms and listen to those lungs, listen to those lungs. This might need a pacemaker. It could not be a, may not be a fluid problem. It may not, so not preload. It may not be an afterload problem. It may not be a contractility problem. It may not, it may be a heart rate problem. So sometimes a cure for this might be pacemaker, but that's discussed in med surge. Here we're talking, the drugs that we're talking about here is for, uh, this is for pharmacological treatment. Of the heart failure but a pacemaker might fix this slick as rain and then the benefits of the heart pacemaker over medications is no side effects no adverse effects no no pharmacokinetics no effects on the liver no effects on the on the on the kidneys as well so look at a little bit from that lung congestion causes enough a cough and orthopnea the patient cannot lay down they have to stay sitting down because they start to drown in their own fluid when pulmonary edema occurs Patient feels like he is suffocating. Extreme anxiety might result. You see that? Non-compliance with sodium is sodium restriction is usually part of the problem. So you need to that way you know what a patient looks like and what kind of conversation you should be having or what kind of questions you should be asking so that you can start putting together what this what's going on with this clinical picture. So that's hard for you right there. That's part of your review. Lipids, page 328. Got a couple of minutes here. Let me see if I can squeeze lipids in really quick. 328. Three, three, twenty-seven, three, twenty-eight. Lipids. Le right hand side, three twenty-eight. Right hand side, twenty-three point three. A little bit towards the bottom. The goal. There you go. The goal of main of main in maintaining normal cholesterol levels is to maximize your HDL, minimize your LDL. The goal is sometimes stated as a ratio. You see that. If the ratio is greater than five, the male patient is considered at risk for cardiovascular disease because women usually have a higher HDL until they hit menopause. Their ratio is different for men. Ratios of 4.4 in women increase their risk of cardiovascular disease. So consider the cardioprotective properties of estrogen. So postmenopausal women, estrogen drops, and then the, the chances equate as well. Uh, also, I have for tabled uh, 23.1 on page 329, your lab values. Look at what is considered the uh, good and what is considered bad. You don't have to know every single high risk, low risk, minimal risk. Look at the main things. Like, for example, total cholesterol, what do you want? Less than 200. LDL, cholesterol, what do you want? Less than 100. See that? HDL, what do you want? You want greater than 60. Serum triglycerides, what do you want? You want less than 150. That's, that's what you should know. Just th that limit. What's the goal? Less than what? Higher than what? That's it. That's it. Keep it simple. What else do we have also? Um, page 329. Oh, that is that table right there. Yeah, that's the main thing. So know those limits. Yeah, that's what I had for that part.
Alrighty, guys, we're going to hit one hour. I'm going to cut this video out. Let me make a second one. I'm trying to not stay too chatty, but I do have it concise. The next video should go a lot quicker. Uh, see you on the next one. See you in a bit.